Thanks for joining us. This is Kara Maciel, and I appreciate all of you joining us for the what is going to be our final webinar in this year in our firm's 2023 Labor and Employment Webinar Series. Today, we're going to be talking about the National Labor Relations Board and some joint employer updates. Um, and with that, we are going to kick it off. Uh, as I said, I'm Kara Maciel. Um, I am chair of the firm's um, labor and employment practice, where I, you know, handle all aspects of the employment law relationship. I work on defending employers in litigation. So I'm a litigator and defend them at both the federal and state level as it relates to discrimination, ADA, wage and hour, and whistleblower regulations. I also do employment counseling where I advise my clients on policies and procedures, handbook reviews, issues relating to hiring, internal investigations, and termination. And then most relevant for today, I advise companies on labor matters, both unionized and non-unionized workplaces. For unionized, I handle union negotiations. I defend unfair labor practices before the board. And then for non-union workplaces, I do a lot of handbook reviews, reviews of policies and procedures, review of, of discipline to ensure compliance with the ever-changing labor law uh, structure, as we'll talk about today, and the landscape uh, before the board, as well as doing a lot of training, a lot of uh, supervisor training on maintaining a union-free workplace. With me, I'm proud to have my, um, my, my uh, attorney, Andrea Chavez, and I'm going to let her introduce herself before we kick it off. As Kara mentioned, I'm Andrea Chavez. I'm relatively new to the firm, and I'm very excited to be here. I'm senior counsel located in Los Angeles. I specialize in employment discrimination, wage and hour uh, litigation. I also handle NLRB matters, um, and my practice further focuses on uh, advice and counseling for employers, so things like handbooks, employment agreements, um, and then also uh, safety safety issues. Great. Thanks, Andrea. <clears throat> okay, so we're talking today about the National Labor Relations Board. And many of you may know, but just let me give you a big, broad uh, overview. This is the five-member board that sits in Washington, D.C., um, and they really handle things related to uh, labor issues with the workplaces. And it's not just unionized workplaces, but it is includes non-unionized workplaces. And a lot of what they are focused on, and particularly the board and the, and the makeup right now, is improving the rights and freedoms of all employees in the workplace, regardless of whether they're represented by a union. And so you'll start to see that it, it is really shifting to a very pro-employee friendly board, uh, the board is always uh, chaired by um, the, the party that is in the administration, the, the party of the president. And so currently the board is chaired by Lauren McFerrin. She has served as a member of the board um, since 2014. Her term expired last in December of 2019, but shortly thereafter, the Senate reconfirmed her nomination as a board member, um, and it, her term will expire at the end of next year. Uh, in January of 2021, President Biden named her as chair of the, of the board. Prior to that, she had served in the Senate as chief labor counsel for the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, she is well respected uh, in the board. Um, we know some former uh, some former members of the board, and I think that she is, she is someone that is able to work very closely, kind of across the aisle with her with her fellow members, um, and it is largely largely well respected. There's three other members of the board are Marvin Kaplan. He is a member that was appointed by President Trump. He's been, um, he's served as a member of the NLRB since 2017. In 2020, he was confirmed for another term of five years and his term will expire in August of 2025. Prior to serving on the board, um, he served as chief counsel to the chairman of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. David Prouty is a member of the board that was appointed um, as a Democrat. He was nominated by President Biden in June of 2021 and confirmed by the Senate shortly thereafter. 
his term will last until August of 2026. Right. He did not come from the government like um, Ms. McFerrin and Mr. Kaplan. He, he, he has a long tenure serving labor unions, um, serving as general counsel for the Service Employee International Union, the SEIU, um, which was the largest labor union for property service workers in the country. He also served as general counsel for the uh, Major League Baseball Players Association and also for um, the Unite Here, uh, which is a, a large hospitality union. So Mr. Prouty comes to the board with a very solid pro-union um, legal background um, supporting labor unions across the country. And then we have um, Ms. Wilcox. She was confirmed by the Senate in September of 2023 for a second term. She her term had expired previously, but she so her term is will end in August of 2028. She uh, prior to being on the board, she had worked in private practice in New York City as a labor and employment firm. And while there, she served as associate general counsel of the SEIU United Healthcare Workers and as a labor representative to the New York City Office of Collective Bargaining. There is one vacancy that was um, that was a, a Republican member whose term expired and the uh, President Biden has not renominated anyone to fill that position. As many of you may know or have heard, President Biden has promised during his, his campaign and, and throughout his, his uh, presidency to be one of the strongest presidents advocating for labor and unions um, that has ever been in, uh, a president. And I think he is working hard to meet that goal. So we really have often right now, when we're looking at cases, a three to one uh, Democrat majority, a pro-employee, pro-union friendly majority board. And that filters throughout the, the rest of the board and their field offices around the country. What I think is interesting about these term expirations is if you notice that everybody other than Ms. McFerrin's term will continue into the next administration. So Mr. Kaplan, Mr. Prouty, Ms. Wilcox, they will their their terms will continue um, regardless of whether there is a continuation of, of Mr. of President Biden's administration uh, in 2025 or uh, or if there's a different administration. Ms. McFerrin, her term expires December 2024, which will allow President Biden to renominate her, and we'll see if we can get if, if the Senate will confirm that um, before the next administration. But if that does happen, there will be for sure three Democrats on the board for a significant amount of time into the next administration, even if the next president, if it's not President Biden, is able to name the chair. The chair will always be, as I said, um, led by a member of the administration's party, but it will still be a three to two uh, a majority board, which which will allow um, you know the Democratic priorities of pro union and pro employees rulemaking and case adjudication to continue significantly into the next administration. So I think that's a that that that's an interesting and, and unusual occurrence that could happen uh, in the next administration. So with that, I want to turn to Andrea. She's going to cover one of the most notable uh, rulemaking initiatives that and regulatory initiatives that the board has implemented through the joint employer. Thanks, Kara. Um, so yeah, the, the NLRB is very active this year, and that includes a new joint employer final rule, which was issued October 26, 2023, which will repeal and replace the current 2020 standard enacted by the Trump era board. I will get into this more later, but essentially the standard is moving from one that requires substantial direct and immediate control over workers' essentials, terms, and conditions of employment to a role where an entity is a joint employer if it has the right to exercise control over certain terms and conditions of employment, even if it never actually exercises such control, and even if such control is indirect. So the new rule largely reestablishes the Obama era standard, but it actually goes further than the standard, which again, I'll, I'll talk about on the next um, slide. So the new rule was scheduled 
to become effective on January 6, 2023, but the NLRB extended that date to February 26, 2024, due to some pending legal challenges. But absent a decision on the challenges or an injunction, this rule will go into effect in February. So now I'll go over just a brief history of the joint employer rule, um, especially because in the last 10 years, it's definitely been in flux and there it tends to change with each administration. Um, prior to 2015, the rule remained relatively consistent for quite a few years. Uh, joint employers had to meaningfully affect matters relating to the employment relationship, such as hiring, firing, discipline, supervision um, of the employees of another. And the essential element was whether the entity's control over employment matters was direct and immediate. Um, during the Obama administration, the board rejected the direct and immediate control framework in its decision routing Harris Industries of California and established a new standard. And this new standard evaluated whether a common law employment relationship existed and whether the entity possessed sufficient control over employees' essential terms and conditions of employment to permit meaningful bargaining. Now, in, employee, in applying both these prongs, direct and immediate control was no longer required to establish a joint employer relationship. Um, instead, the NLRB held that reserved and indirect control, you know, such as through um, an intermediary or through a contract reserving such control was potentially sufficient to establish in and of itself a joint employer relationship. However, this decision in um, Browning Ferris allowed for consideration of the extent to which the potential control existed and whether it was material in bargaining. And that's the real difference between that rule and this new final rule, where essentially in this new final rule, any reserved and indirect control and or indirect control of essential terms and conditions of employment will be sufficient to establish a joint employer relationship. Um, okay, so the employer in Browning Ferris, uh, or the employer Browning Ferris filed a petition for review with the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and while that petition was pending, the Trump era board came in and overturned the NLRB Browning Ferris decision and reinstated the traditional direct and immediate control standard. Um, then in 2020, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals came back and, and partially uh, affirmed the 2015 Browning Ferris decision and found that common law permits consideration of uh, indirect and reserved control and the NLRB must apply common law. Um, the matter was remanded back to the NLRB to clarify the standard and address you know, the amount of indirect control and reserved authority necessary to create a joint employer relationship. In response, the Trump era board issued uh, the final rule, which is currently now in place, uh, requiring proof of indirect and immediate control over workers, and also clarifying that indirect and or reserved control um, would only be considered to the extent such control supplemented and reinforced an entity's direct and immediate control. So that's where we are now. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this new final rule uh, defines joint employers as two or more entities with an employment relationship, two or more entities with an employment relationship with the same group of employees where each entity shares or co-determines matters governing those employees' essentials, terms, and conditions. So what does that mean? Um, a, a common law employer shares or co-determines such matters if 
the employer possesses the authority to control, whether directly, indirectly, or both, or the authority to exercise the power to control, again, whether directly, indirectly, or both, one or more of the employee's central terms of conditions of employment. And this rule applies uniformly, uniformly to all types of business relationships. So it's going to have a huge effect on, um, you know, with franchises, temp agencies, staffing firms. Um, yeah, a lot of business relationships are going to be affected by this new rule. Um, so luckily, the board did provide us um, an exhaustive list of what essential terms and conditions are. Um, and you'll see that list here. It includes things like wages, benefits, hours of work, assignments of duties, supervision, um, direction regarding the methods of performance of the duties, grounds for discipline, hiring and discharge, and working conditions related to safety and health of employees. Um, so just to make clear, the reserved right to control one or more of these essential terms and conditions will be sufficient now to establish a joint employer relationship, whether or not such control is ever actually exercised and whether or not such control is direct or indirect. So essentially, if you know, if you hire, for example, a staffing company and hire that staffing company to train their employees that are going to be providing you services on your safety policies, which we see that, you know, every day, that would likely be enough to establish a joint employer relationship under this new role. Um, I also wanted to note one more thing is it's that, you know, there are different joint employer rules for different laws. And this new joint employer rule affects the joint employer uh, relationship under the NLRA only. It doesn't affect current rules of joint employment employment under like federal wage and hour law or state laws. Okay, so if your company is a joint employer under this new rule, what does that mean? Um, well, joint employers will have the duty to collectively bargain with labor unions over the terms and conditions which it has direct or indirect authority to control. And this requirement includes the essential terms and conditions as defined in this rule. So the ones we just went over above and also non-essential but mandatory subjects of bargaining that it has the authority to control. Um, another thing is that joint employers can be liable for the actions of the other employer if they knew of unlawful actions of that other employer and did nothing to protest it. And then finally, entities that were previously neutral or considered neutral employers, but are now joint employers are now susceptible to legal picketing as primary employers. Um, and while you know, this is different because when they were considered neutral employers, such picketing would be considered a secondary boycott and unlawful. The next slide. So as expected, there has been um, challenges to this final rule already. The House and state lawmakers introduced a Congressional Review Act resolution to overturn the final rule and the U.S. Chambers of Commerce um, and a coalition of business groups filed a complaint against the NLRB in the U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Texas. Um, but again, you know, we don't know the outcome of the challenges yet. So unless there is a ruling on these challenges or an injunction, the rule will become effective um, fe February 2024. So in light of that, what are your next steps? Um, you should monitor these developments regarding the challenges closely. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we suggest proceeding as if the rule will become effective. 
um, in February. <clears throat> so review or written contracts and actual practices uh, with other parties, determining if you have um, reserved the right to control other entities, workers, essentials, terms and conditions, again, whether directly or indirectly. And you know, you'll have to weigh the risk of being deemed a joint employer under the NLRA versus the need to retain the control over the worker. And in reality, a lot of employers, um, it's going to be nearly impossible to comply with other laws, such as safety laws, and not be considered a joint employer. So if possible, revise your contracts to relinquish your control um, or at least minimize your control. And if you are the entity con contracting for services from another company, we suggest utilizing indemnification clauses to the extent you're not already. Um, you know, this will cover certain costs and expenses resulting from any issues with, you know, a joint employer relationship. And finally, train your employees. If you, you know, take the time to revise your contracts, make sure your managers know of the new, um, of the changes and how they're supposed to be treating um, the other workers. Okay, that's great. I'll pass Thanks. Back to you. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, so another really important rule um, that came out uh, from the board this this year was the final rule on the representation election cases. The representation election cases, this is RC petitions. This is the, the type of a petition when a union files with the board to say that it has garnered enough support from a majority of the employees in order to start the election process to unionize at the um, at the facility, at the workplace. And so once an RC petition is filed, it starts this this a lot of a lot of timing issues and things that happen very, very quickly. Um, over the course of, of a few weeks before the vote is actually held as to whether the union should be uh, represented or not. And so in August of, 2020, of 2023, the board issued its final rule governing these election procedures. This has also been an issue like the joint employer rule that often flip-flops back and forth between the, the administration in terms of these types of rulemaking. We've seen um, this these these rules, these rep representation cases, rules change back and forth since the Obama administration, the Trump administration changed them back. And here we are with the Biden administration, again, making, making them shorter. The rules will become effective later this month, um, December 26th, and will really drastically shorten the amount of time you have to respond to an election petition, again, by returning back to the standard that had been adopted in 2014 during the Obama administration. And this is what um, Chair McFerrin had said when the rule, the final rule came out. Their theory is that really the basic principle of the National Labor Relations Act is that representation cases should be resolved quickly and fairly without unnecessary delays from the election process. So we talk about you know the quickie, quickie election rule. I mean, she's using the word quickly too. That is entirely what this is about. And really, I'll talk about the consequences really it hinders an employer's opportunity to uh, respond to uh, an organizing campaign. So the major changes, there are a lot of changes, but the major changes to the election procedures are on timing. So now pre-election hearings will be scheduled eight calendar days from service of the petition, which is 14 days earlier um, than the previous 14 day business day requirement. So eight calendar days from the day that you receive a petition, you're gonna have a hearing over that, really gives you a very little amount of time to meet with your counsel, meet with your managers, meet with the rest of your team to figure out what are your right legal arguments that could be raised at a hearing as to whether the unit is appropriate, whether there's other issues with respect to um, the, you know, the unit that's been described, whether maybe there's supervisors that could be included that should not be allowed to vote in the in the election process. So very, very quick schedule. 
Statements of position will be due seven calendar days. So that, and that's three days earlier than had been previously position. So essentially the, the statement of position is due the day before the pre-election hearing. Again, not giving you a lot of time to be able to pull together those arguments uh, in response to the, to the petition. The board has said that regional directors, which is, you know, there's approximately 48, you know, uh, regions across the country and they're all led by a regional director. Um, election hearings are often, uh, uh, run by a hearing officer, it's not the regional director, um, but the regional director will have very limited ability to extend these deadlines. Essentially, you know, you can have two more business days for special or extraordinary circumstances. Didn't quite define what special or extraordinary circumstances are, but the fact that you may have a, you know, a conflict or your, you know, the your managers aren't able to be present at the hearing uh, might not be necessarily special or extraordinary circumstances. So the hearing, you know, is really set to happen with, with limited ability to be extended. Post hearing briefs will be allowed only when the either the regional director or the hearing officer determines they are necessary and not as a matter of right. So really oftentimes you'll you know you'll be obligated at the hearing itself or when the hearing concludes to summarize your arguments orally rather than having the time to put together the testimony put together the evidence that was put forth in a comprehensive, clear manner for the, the hearing officer or regional director, which is often needed for appellate reasons to be able to preserve a record and be able to preserve it if, if you're going to challenge the outcome of the election um, through the board's process. So what does this really mean? As we've said, this is the quickie election rule, and it really just means that there's less time for you to respond to a union petition. So things to think about in responding to this final rule, right? So you want to make sure that you are aware of all relevant election timelines before a union demands recognition based on signed authorization cards. I'll talk a little bit about recognition process, but oftentimes the board, you know, the union will either come and approach a man member of management say, hey, I have majority support of your workforce. And so I ask that you demand recognition. And we don't even have to go through the election process. You can just recognize us as a matter of course, or they will um, you know, demand recognition as soon by checking a box on the petition form. And the first time you're hearing about it is when you receive an RC petition in your in your email box from the board. So it's really important that you're aware uh, and be prepared in advance of what those timelines are that I just talked about, you know, the, the pre-hearing, the position statement, any, any notice, any postings that would be required, things that have to be done so you're not scrambling to do that after uh, a petition is filed. Certainly you want to chain, you know, you want to train supervisors and, and potentially even potential voters, which would be, you know, your employees about the union election process so they understand what their rights are, what they can and cannot say really before any organizing occurs. I strongly recommend training at a minimum your supervisors right now and in early into 2024 because, you know, the senior executives and HR, may, they may know a lot of this stuff. But, you know, it's your managers that are interacting with the employees on a day to day basis. They're the ones that are going to be the first lines of defense and the first people that might even hear about potential organizing. And you'll want to be ready to respond to that. And so those those managers and supervisors should really understand not only what the election process involves, but what they should be doing and hearing and responding um, if in the event they hear of, of organizing. And this is what this is why I say that staying union free is a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day priority. It should be at the forefront of human resources um, department and the C-suites uh, agenda. Um, it's something that because of the election rules and the way this final rule has been applied, it's very difficult to get your ducks in a row as soon as you receive a, a, a petition. You've got to continually be communicating the positivity of, of your workplace, why you're a great employer, why you, why, you know, your discipline and your policies and procedures are implemented fairly and uniformly across the board, 
um, there isn't any type of favoritism and that your workplace is a competitive workplace with respect to wages and benefits and, and all the other things so that there's no reason why a employee in a union free workplace would seek third party representation from a union um, rather than you know just communicating concerns within the workplace. Certainly let's stay apprised of potential legal challenges to the final rule. Um, as I said, this is flip flop back and forth and there have been challenges. Um, and so we'll see after it becomes effective, whether there are some 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 final, um, some legal challenges to stay apprised. We'll keep, you know, our firm or keep, we'll keep people apprised too. Um, but I like with the joint employer rule, I think it's really important for everyone to act as if this, this rule is gonna take effect the end of December and has a radical shift in how unions can organize uh, in 2024. So in addition to these two really important regulatory initiatives that the board has implemented, there also have been some pretty dramatic cases that impact all workplaces, including non-work, non-unionized workplaces. So the first thing I want to talk about is Semex. So this is an important case in how employers respond to union organizing demands. As I mentioned, in the previous section, you know, you, unions organize workplaces two ways. One is they can file an RC petition, which starts the, the formal framework of an election process with the board. They also can just demand recognition by saying, I am, uh, I represent, like I said, a majority of the employees, more than 50% of the interest. And as a result, you, we don't even need to deal with a representation election we can just go ahead and you can just represent, you can, you know, recognize us as the representative of all the employees, not just the majority who signed cards. And so in August of 2023, the board issued its decision in Semex Construction Materials Pacific LLC, announcing a new standard from when you are required to bargain, bargain at the table with unions without an election. Um, and I'll just kind of, you know, but my thoughts process here is, you know, I've always counseled clients that it is not a good idea to automatically recognize a union upon a demand for bargaining, because while they may say they, they represent a majority of the employees, what happens, you know, that doesn't give the other minority employees an opportunity to say yes or no. Yes, I want to be represented by a union or no, I want to be represented by a union. And I think as an as workplaces and employers, they really should be allowing all their employees an opportunity to say yay or nay in an election rather than binding them to be uh, you know, represented by a union if that's not their choice. But nonetheless, under, under the CEMEX framework, uh, the new framework, when a union requests recognition, on the basis that they represent a majority of employees in a bargaining unit. Um, and they say they've designated this union, you know, um, uh, you know, whether, whether it's Unite Here, whether it's SEIU, whether it's Teamsters as their representative, you must either one, recognize and bargain with the union, or two, file a petition seeking your own election within two weeks. And if you don't file that petition quickly enough, the board can art can order you to bargain with the union without an election. So in that, in response to this, really what I think is a pretty dramatic uh, shift, um, which really again forces you to, to know and have a labor strategy in place well before you ever are approached by a union through um, a demand for rec recognition or with a petition. Um, the general counsel issued a memorandum answering some guy providing some guidance and, and answering some questions, um, but but still open questions remain. So the first thing was what qualifies as a demand for bargaining, and the general counsel clarified that it doesn't have to be any special form. It even can be conveyed verbally. So no magic words. I want a demand for bargaining, or here's the the majority cards, or here's a letter. Here's something formal in writing. It can be a verbal conversation and just a statement that I, local 524 of the Teamsters, have support from a majority of the employees and I want to bargain with them. And the other thing that I think is pretty dramatic in, in the shift is to whom should that demand be conveyed, verbally even? 
And what the board said is any agent acting on your behalf, which can even be a lower level supervisor or any other agent of the um, to the employee, or it can be included in the election petition by checking the petition form. So that is another reason why it's absolutely critical that, em that employers provide training to their supervisors. Anyone who's considered a manager or supervisor that's an agent of the employer, because a union member can just walk into your workplace, approach that supervisor and verbally say, I have support from a majority of the employees, and that supervisor might just be like, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about, whatever, and go about their business. But that two week clock of needing to either bargain with the union or file your own RM petition, that starts ticking. So it's very important that supervisors know what they should be doing should any, um, any employee from uh, a union approaches them. And then what happens if you disagree with the union's proposed unit? I mean, they'll, they'll define it they should define it again, verbally or in writing. But you may say, no, actually this unit should be broader. It should include these other employees or it should be a different set of, of, of class, workplace classifications or this unit includes you know, a whole bunch of supervisors and, and I wanna clarify that. So what you need to do is you need to file your own election petition. That's what we call an RM petition and describe your proposed unit definition but also offer evidence why the unions, the unit, the union's unit is inappropriate. So again, in these two weeks, very, very quickly requires you to provide a lot of information and evidence and you know, potentially requires you to seek your own petition through the election process. So CEMEX is, uh, you know, again, another way that the board is making it very easy for unions to organize either through the election process, through the revised uh, final rule, or just from a demand for bargaining, um, you know, uh, reaching their goal to be more uh, pro-union friendly. So in addition to um, CEMEX, there were some other pretty important cases. What two involved protected concerted activity? And these, in these two cases, the board really dramatically expanded protections for employee advocacy in the workplace. In the first case, which is American Federation, the board revived prior precedent by holding that the National Labor Relations Act protects statutory employees advocating on behalf of non-employees, such as interns and contractors. Um, American Federation for Children involved an employee who tried to elicit support from her coworkers to make sure that her employer rehired and agreed to sponsor the work permit for a former coworker. And you know when the, the charge was brought, the original administrative law judge was applying prior precedent and held that the you know the former employee is not an employee under the act. It's a former employee, and as a result, the fact that the employee was advocating on behalf of that individual was not considered conduct for mutual aid and protection within the meaning of Section Seven. Um, as, as those of you may recall, Section 7 of the Act guarantees employees the right to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining, or in this case, other mutual aid or protection. And so what the board did in American Federation, it just adopted a much more expansive understanding of what it means to be conduct for mutual aid and protection um, by including uh, these non-employees, um, as long as the statutory employees were affecting their own terms and conditions of employment, making it concerted and protected under the act. The board specifically titled it as and characterized it as the solidarity principle. So the, the question and what they held was the question is simply whether in helping those persons, employees potentially aid and protect themselves whether by directly improving their own terms and conditions of employment or by creating the possibility of future reciprocal support from others in their efforts to better working conditions. So what's, what's a little challenging about this decision, it's really could be very far reaching. There's no limiting principle or guidance regarding whether or when the potential for future reciprocal support 
will become too speculative or attenuated to rely upon as establishing mutual aid and protection. Um, so really just be aware. So if you have an employee who is, you know, advocating on behalf of non-employees, you want to be mindful of any type of discipline for that behavior because it could be considered protected. The second case that um, the board held was in Miller Plastics Products. And in that case, they returned to the totality of the circumstances case test for determining when individual employee action constitutes protected activity. And they really felt that it's going to go back to this holistic fact-based approach to determine whether individual complaints or protests you know, would be considered concerted, right? Linking to a group action, making it much easier for a single worker's actions to be considered concerted and therefore protected. Um, essentially reaffirmed the, the, the principle that the question of whether an, engage, an employee is engaged in concerted activity is a factual one. Um, in, that, in that particular case, the board felt that, felt that Miller violated the act when it fired an employee for blurting out during a March 2020 meeting that he and his coworkers shouldn't be working amid the exploding COVID-19 crisis. So what you wanna really be doing is when you've got an employee by themselves voicing a concern, um, a complaint during a work meeting or a complaint to a supervisor, you need to think about you know, in a holistic way, looking at all the facts and circumstances, whether that individual um, complaint is considered protected activity under the NLRA and limiting your ability to take action um, for, that, for that workplace complaint. The board also revised its standard for work rules and whether the employer's work rules and handbook policies unlawfully restrict protected activity under the act uh, in Stericycle uh, earlier this year. So in this particular case, they said that work rules will be presumptively unlawful if they have a reasonable tendency to chill employees from exercising their organizing rights or otherwise have a coercive meaning. Um, and the burden is gonna now be shifted to the employer to prove that its handbook rules um, you know, are legitimate and that legitimate substantial business interests cannot be accomplished with a more narrowly tailored rule. Um, this rule really impacts everyone but more so, as I said, in a union organizing context, if, you're, if you've are if you got a union organizing a, a campaign against you, because any employer rule, any, any policy in your handbook that is deemed unlawful can result in an order forcing the employer to bargain with the union without an election under CMEX. So you really wanna make sure that you're reviewing your handbook and your policies with a mindset to whether any of these policies could be either presumptively unlawful because it could, as opposed to would, limit employee rights. But also, secondly, you know whether that handbook rule implicitly limits protected activities um, you know, in the context of any type of employee or theoretical employee. Um, the, the board characterized its rationale by saying, you know, is this going to be limited from the perspective, not so of an unreasonable employee, but from the perspective of someone who is economically dependent on the employer? And what they mean of this sort of state of economic dependency in the workplace really implies that almost any workplace rule could arguably limit employee rights and therefore is illegally coercive. Um, so again, now is the time with because of this really changed, I think significant change in handbook rules, you'll wanna make sure you're closely looking your handbook policies to ensure that they are appropriate, um, recognizing that they will, the board and the union will look at work rules on an individualized basis rather than um, you know, in categories as has been done in the past. Another change is with respect to employee discipline. So uh, in this case, Lion Elastomers LLC 2, the board reverted back to its pre-2020 specific, setting specific standard for determining whether an employer lawfully disciplined an employee for otherwise protected and concerted activity that crosses the line into really abusive conduct. 
So rather than focusing on the employer's motivation for the discipline, the board will consider the following four factors. One, the locus of the activity, where did it happen? Was it at the workplace? Was it online? Was it social media? Was it outside of the workplace? The subject matter of the otherwise protected conduct, the nature of the employee's outburst, and whether the, some, the outburst somehow provoked by, you know, again, the uh, uh, unfair labor practices by the employer. What this really does is it gr gives really greater latitude to employees who are overzealous and maybe even abusive in exercising what would otherwise be activity protected by the act. When we saw cases, you know, several years ago where, you know, employees were incredibly, you know, using harassing or abusive or, you know, offensive comments to their supervisors or to their coworkers. And that should be disciplined under your code of conduct or under your harassment policy. And the board has said, that, um, you know, no, you've gone too far because it could be considered coercive or it could be considered protective. Um, and now they, and that was shifted. And now we've gone back to, as I, as I noted, the pre-2020 really fact specific standard as to whether you can lawfully discipline based on somebody's behavior. So again, review as you're gonna review your handbook policies, um, because of, of the, the case that I just referred to previously, Stericycle, really important to take a special look at your written policies around how workers interact with each other, how they communicate with, the, with each other, and really try and tie that to your, your you know, legitimate business decision of wanting to maintain order and respect um, you know, and making sure that it is, you know, consistent with your anti-discrimination, anti-harassment laws. And again, look at those, look at the harassment policies and make sure that you're providing specific examples of unacceptable conduct that's linked directly to your legal liability, rather than sort of just generalized concerns um, or examples of what is inappropriate behavior in order to, um, you know, comply with this new standard uh, of the board. The next case I wanna talk about is McLaren Macomb. So this relates to severance agreements. For those of you that are you know, either laying off employees, doing reductions in force or otherwise resolving um, you know, EEOC charges or other administrative charges and you decide to offer a severance to an hourly employee, and this is not, and not applies to supervisors or managers, you need to look at two particular clauses that we always had as standard clauses in our severance agreements. And that related to confidentiality and non-disparagement, as well as some of release, a particular release of claims under the act. So you wanna make sure that those, those particular clauses the board has determined are unlawful, could infringe on an employee's rights to, you know, again, talk about the terms and conditions of their employment um, to third parties or other employees if that's you know restricted under a non-disparagement clause um, and not you know release claims that the otherwise would be lawful in the workplace such as inability to bring claim to the EEOC or OSHA um, or other other government agency investigations. So really it, what the decision did is it kind of emphasized as, as you see the trend of these cases, the, the importance of employees' rights to be able to speak about the workplace and what they what the workplace did or their employees or their terms of uh, conditions of employment. And so that agreements that are restricting those kind of statements, again, chills those rights, those concerted rights, um, and are considered unlawful. So if you haven't done so already, this, this decision came out early in 2023. If you've not already done so, definitely take a, a red line to your severance agreements to the extent you're offering them to hourly employees. Some other anticipated changes that we expect to hear from the board, um, you know, over the next year or so, you know, uh, captive audience meetings. These are mandatory meetings with employees uh, during a union campaign. Uh, we expect the board will ban those, make those unlawful. Um, again, further restricting your ability to communicate with your employees about the pros and cons of organizing. Also, the, the, you know, the employee's right to use company email and other electronic communications for non-business purposes, which includes union activity. That's a, a shift, that's a case that's gone back and forth as well. 
We expect the board to step in on their view that non-compete agreements uh, are unlawful. Uh, it, 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 you know, it restricts an abilities, uh, employees' ability to move and, and, and apply for, uh, you know, and change their terms and conditions of employment. Expanding a union's right to access uh, employers' property, and then expecting also a stricter standard for employing permanent strike replacements. So more to come. Lots on the board's agenda. Um, they've been a, had a busy year, as Andrea said earlier. We expect it to be a busy, busy 2024 um, with cases that will impact all workplaces, both unionized and non-unionized. And this gets us to sort of our the final topic before I uh, we close and open it up for questions. And you know, this is we've said they've been busy and they have been busy. Um, this are here's some statistics from just fiscal year 2023. Um, so the total number of unfair labor practice charges were the highest that they the board has ever seen at 19,854. Um, that's almost 2,000 more than last year, and you know over 4,000 from from 2021. So we definitely are seeing the board encouraging, you know, and wanting to take unfair labor practice charges and continue to move them to be able to make these case precedent decisions um, on these topics that we've highlighted today. We've also, you know, seen the highest record number of union representation petitions being filed, and that was even before the union final rule election changes came out. So just in fiscal year 2023, we saw 25 2,594, which is an increase from last year and a huge increase from 2021. So the message that the board is, is union friendly is certainly getting out to non-unionized workplaces. We've seen that across uh, the news with various uh, union organizing and, and strikes that have happened. Um, so I, I don't think that, that that will change, this level will change in 2024. After the board released its decision in, in CEMEX, we saw field offices received 28 RM petitions that had, were filed by employers after being asked to voluntarily recognize the union. They issued 246 decisions in contested cases last year, which is, I talked about probably half a dozen of those significant precedent cases, but there are, there are more out there and there's certainly more to come. And they're really doing this really in the, as they struggle with staffing shortages. Um, they asked for a $25 million increase from Congress for fiscal year, which ended a hiring moratorium, allowing them to backfill some positions, but they still claim they're, they're understaffed uh, and so want more resources to be able to do, uh, continue the work that they've done um, over the last few years. So with that, we've got about four minutes left of our hour. I want to um, open it up for questions, but as a reminder, you know, our firm has a lot of blogs, and if you're not already uh, registered, sign on to the Employer Defense Report. That's where we post uh, weekly updates on labor and employment issues that affect employers across the country, and then we have several other, uh, other, other blogs, including an OSHA defense blog, the Cal OSHA defense report, and um, the MSHA defense report. But in the meantime, let's open it up. If anybody has questions, please pop it in the chat. And Andrea and I will be available to answer them and also available after today's presentation if you have any additional questions. But here's, let me, it looks like we've got one um, question. So I think this is, Andrea, this might be for you. I think this talks about the joint employer rule. Um, this directly impacts OSHA's multi-employer worksite policy, correct? If I'm the owner of a work site and I have multiple contractors on site and I require those contractors to complete safety observations, fill out my, my owner of the site permits, do I become a controlling employer in the eyes of OSHA or the NLRB as a joint employer? Yeah, so this is one of those areas where I was talking about there's going to be crossover and it's going to be hard to comply with the new joint employer uh, law with regards to the NLRB um, or NLRA and then, um, you know, other workplace safety requirements. Um, if you are operating a multi-employer work site, you know, often you have the, your contractor's require their employees to review your your safety policies 
Um, and this is especially true if you're considered the controlling employer, because um, to be the control employer, you, you're responsible by contract or practice for the safety and health conditions at that work site. Um, and you have the authority to correct any violations. So because you have the responsibility, you know, Cal OSHA looks for you to provide some um, training and guidance to your contractors. It's going to be very, very difficult. I would say near impossible to comply with that requirement and also comply with uh, the new joint employer law. Um, as to regards to your specific like situation, I can't comment on that, but I can say if, you know, if you are the owner of a property, uh, you oversee that property, you most likely are a controlling employer because you have the authority to correct violations on that property. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, thank you for participating. I wish everybody a very happy new year and see you in 2024. Thank you.